Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadar Siva Sri Gaur Bhaktivindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare This is a verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam spoken by Lord Brahma Tas Yaifo Heito Patitai Pati Pratyateta Kovido Nalabhyate Ya Brahmatam Upariyadaha Talabhyate Dukhanavad Anya Sukham Kalena Sarvatram Gambira Ramhasa Translation Persons who are actually intelligent and philosophically inclined should endeavor only for that purposeful end which is not attainable even by wandering from the topmost planet of Brahmaloka down to the lowest planet, Patalaloka. As far as happiness derived from sense and German is concerned, it can be obtained automatically in course of time, just as in course of time we obtain miseries even though we do not desire them. Every man everywhere is trying to obtain the greatest amount of sense enjoyment by various endeavors. Some men are busy engaged in trade, industry, economic development, political supremacy, etc. And some of them are engaged in food and work to become happy in the next life by attaining higher planets. It is said that on the moon, the inhabitants are fit for greater sense enjoyment by drinking summer rasa. And the Pitri Luka is obtained by good charitable work. There are various programs for sense enjoyment, either during this life or in the next life after death. Some are trying to reach the moon or other planets by some mechanical arrangement but they are very anxious to get into such planets without doing good work, but it is not to happen. By the law of the supreme, different planets, planets, places are meant for different grades of living beings, according to the work they have performed. By good work only, as prescribed in the scriptures, one can obtain birth in a good family, opulence, good education, good bodily features. We see also then that even in this life, one obtains a good education or money by good work. Similarly, in our next birth, we get such desire positions only by good work. Otherwise, it would not so happen that two persons born in the same place at the same time are seen differently placed according to previous work. But all such material positions are impermanent. The position in the topmost Brahma Loka and in the lowest Patel Loka are changeable according to our work. The philosophically inclined person must not be tempted by such changeable positions. He should, divide, he should try to get into the permanent life of bliss and knowledge where he will not be forced to come back again to the miserable material world, either in this or that planet. Miseries and mixed happiness are two features of material life, and they are obtained in Brahma Loka and in other Lokas also. They are obtained in the life of the demigods and also in the life of the dogs and hogs. The miseries of mixed happiness of all living beings are only of different degree and quality, but no one is free from the miseries of birth, death, old age, and disease. Similarly, Everyone has his destined happiness also. No one can get more or less of these things simply by personal endeavor. 
Even if they are obtained, they can be lost again. One should not therefore waste time with these flimsy things. One should endeavor to go back to Godhead. This should be the mission of everyone's life. This verse spoken by Lord Brahma is actually divided into two sections. You can see those who are philosophically inclined and have a good amount of intelligence. Um, it's giving a warning. Uh, they should endeavor only for that which is permanent, not for which is temporary. Uh, the material world is temporary. And all situations in the material world are temporary. Um, the living entity by nature is eternal. And even in our, our endeavors to find happiness in the, the realm of eterna, temporary, we want something that is not temporary. Everyone wants happiness and also longevity one cannot find both of these things to any degree. But this is the nature of the material world. And uh, it's exp it spans itself in quite a large array of material situations. And as Srila Prabhupada said, all provide some type of sense gratification. Sense gratification is seen as the means for happiness in the material world. To come in contact through the senses with the objects of the senses and derive some kind of satisfaction or pleasure that is called material life or the goal of material life. Even though people know, and sometimes they are not consciously aware, but they, are, they know that whatever they have and whatever they obtain is temporary. Still, they, they continue in a way because they're not aware that there is something that fits the desires that, of our heart. In other words, we want to live forever and we want something that gives us lasting happiness. Although we know we can't find it in this world, at least subconsciously, we know that. Still, we try for it. Why? Because it's our nature. <laughs> it's our nature. We want something that is natural because the word nature and natural are from the same word. That which is our nature is natural. The which is against our nature is unnatural. And therefore, we want to live forever. And we do but we somehow mistakenly uh, calculate that living forever is based on the situation that we direct ourselves in. In other words, we want to live forever in this body, but we can't. <laughs> it's just not possible because the body is temporary, the body is material, the body is uh, changing, it changes from different levels of its existence. And finally, it disappears by the arrangements of the material energy or the arrangements of the Supreme Lord through the agency of the material energy. And so here, one who is actually, you know, the word actually is given, intelligent, because some people may present themselves as being intelligent and they may also look intelligent but intelligence is, under, is understood in terms of not only the ability to discriminate, act on that, but to direct oneself in a way that is beneficial. The intelligent. intelligent person, we sometimes we see they have degrees in universities 
have obtained some kind of status in society by, by, by many achievements or have the ability to manipulate the material energy in order to get some kind of arrangement which is satisfactory to them. But that is not intelligence. It's actually, it's also a kind of intelligence. We, we, should, we have to give that credit. But there's two things, and one is called sukritina, and the other one is duskritina. Su means good or auspicious, duskritina means inauspicious, and uh, in, uh, in other words, not beneficial. A duskritina means, just like you see, people, uh, the scientists and others, they can create these fantastic uh, mechanical devices such as airplanes, huge airplanes that can fly through the air. So in order to you know, create such things, it takes intelligence, there's no question. But what is the benefit? You know, it, the only benefit it is that we think we're saving time by moving faster through the material energy. That's not a considered to be intelligent because what is the benefit? And when, if there is some benefit, there also is loss along with that benefit because anything material, as it says here, mixed happiness, Prabhupada uses the word misery and mixed happiness. In other words, there's no such thing as pure happiness in the material world. There is misery, yes, and there is mixed happiness. That means that happiness is mixed with misery. So even that which is considered to be desirable is mixed with something undesirable. That is the nature of this world. And that's why Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Dukalaya Masasratam and Anitya Asubam. He's explaining that this world is temporary and it is miserable. <laughs> so one who's actually intelligent will think, well, I don't want to die, and I want to be happy, and I want to uh, find myself in a situation where I can fulfill my desires. But in the material world, it's not possible. So that initial type of discrimination or contemplation, we might say, is a feature of good intelligence, which leads one to think, is there a place where I can fulfill these desires. Spiritual world. So topmost planet in the material world, Brahmaloka, down to the lowest, Patala, who's a speaker of this verse, he has to at one point leave his situation and uh, go into another material situation. No one, nothing anywhere in the material world is permanent or can give lasting satisfaction and happiness. So a person will think, where, where is that place or is there a place that I can live forever that I can fulfill all my desires, that I can be free from all suffering? And that is the spiritual world, which is synonymous or what we say comparable, comparable to our nature. The spiritual world fits our nature because we are by nature spiritual. That's why we struggle in this material world because we are in a odd situation. We're in we're in and an anomaly. To be in the material world means to be in an anomaly. Uh, we have a material body which is given to us, and we have to accept whatever misery and happiness comes by way of the material body that we have. And that leads us to the next part of the verse where Brahma says, as far as happiness derived from sense enjoyment is concerned, it can be obtained automatically in course of time, just as in course of time we obtain miseries even though we do not desire them. This is an interesting part of the verse. 
And what does this mean is that no one can increase or decrease the amount of happiness and the amount of suffering that they are destined to obtain. Karma, Daiva, Natrena. Karma, Daiva, Natrena means that when we take birth, we have, we, it's already written in our karmic account how much of material happiness we will get, how much material suffering we will, uh, that is due to us that is there based on our collective karma from our previous lives and particularly our last life. So that is there. So the verse is saying, why try for happiness when you're not trying for misery, but you get it. No one actually plans to be miserable. They may they might plan to make other people miserable, but they don't. But for themselves, everyone is thinking how to extend happiness. Of course, material sense gratification is the standard for happiness, and therefore takes on different forms. A person's happiness may be to see another person suffer. <laughs> to see themselves move forward in the material way. For a person, happiness may be to, uh, you know, see others become happy. So that's, those are the three modes of material nature. A person in ignorance, their happiness is based on seeing others suffer. In passion, it's about getting ahead materially. And about goodness, about giving pleasure to others in the material way. accordingly. So these, uh, these are the different types of categories where sense gratification fits in. And then of course, within that, there are so many applications. Srimad Chaitanya Charitamrita in the fourth chapter mentions that there are 22 ways by which one can endeavor for sense gratification. Um, I'm not sure of the verse, it's Chaitanya Charitamrita, chapter four. Uh, can't remember the actual verse number. Um, it's towards the end of the chapter. But in there, it describes 22 ways that one can satisfy their senses. 20 different types of sense gratification. And so that comes automatically. And it's interesting because if people could understand this verse, especially the second half, there wouldn't be so many problems in the world. All right, why try for happiness when it'll come just like no one tries for distress, but it comes. So the, these two things are parallel in their deliverance. We get the happiness that is due to us materially and we get the suffering that is due to us materially. Of course, by our activities, you know, we bring about these two things, but no one can change the amount. You can change how it comes. For example, you're living in a cold climate and you're finding you're suffering because of excessive cold. So you might think, well, let me live in a warmer climate and then I'll uh, you know, I'll reduce the suffering come by based on cold. So you do that. But what happens, the suffering that you were due will come in another form. That's all. The forms, how the suffering and enjoyment come, you can, you can influence that. You can get happiness one way. You can get your karmic happiness one way or you can get it in another way. But you can't change the amount. That's the point. The amount will stay the same. And as we perform activities in this life, we're also uh, preparing for our future happiness and distress accordingly. So therefore a person will think, well, why, why, why try to work so hard to obtain things 
that even if I get it, it's not going to increase my happiness because my happiness is already a destined. Let me live in such a way as I can, I can, I can aspire for that kind of happiness that is not influenced by activities. And that is Brahma Sokyam or spiritual happiness, uh, which is Nayam Deho Deho Bhajan Dirloke. Kastan Kama Arati Vid Bhujanje Tapal Divyam Putra Kadyena Sadvam Brahma Sokam Tanantam Tasmad Brahma Sokyam Anantam. Anantam means eternal. That happiness that does not end, that is Brahma Sokyam or the spiritual happiness, which is the nature of the soul's existence. As we as is often mentioned, the soul is Satchit Ananda. It's eternal, doesn't take birth, nor does it die. Chip, it has full knowledge, not necessarily the knowledge of, you know, uh, facts and figures, but it has what we call spiritual knowledge or real knowledge, that knowledge which is uh, intuitive according to one's position. In other words, uh, that happiness, which is by, that knowledge, which by nature is, the result of our existence. Just like people go to school to get the word, to get uh, to get knowledge or to get some, uh, yeah, to get knowledge. So they think they're going to school to learn something. But the word, um, what is the word? It's called, uh, oh, let me think of that. Uh, Hmm. It refers to knowledge. Uh, it's a Latin word. Uh, well, it means that knowledge is not something that you obtain, but it's something you reveal. Educari, thank you, Sri Devi. Yeah, so educari is a Latin word and it means that which brings out, that which brings out. So bringing out the knowledge that is there within us means that we become aware of that knowledge. It's not like putting on a coat of paint you go and you want to put a color on the wall, so you get some paint and you paint. So you're adding something to the wall to change its appearance. But we, so we go to school and we think we're gonna add something onto our existence, but what do we get? We get what is called, not knowledge, but we get is called silpavidya. Silpavidya means that, that knowledge, which is based on material, existence. In other words, that which is lost in time, or that which is technical, or that which is practical. But real knowledge is not technical or practical. It's intuitive. It is the nature of the soul. And that now knowledge brings one to the point of unlimited happiness, which is the other feature and the most important part of the soul's existence. The soul is ananda, so these three principles are our nature and it, and it can be found only in the spiritual realm, not in the material realm. And as Prabhupada says here, no one can get more or less of these things simply by personal endeavors. So if we can remember that, and people in general can remember, no one can get more or less of the, of happiness and distress simply by personal endeavor. Even if we obtain something, they're lost again in due course of time. So therefore, one should aspire for uh, what we say, Brahma Sokyam, transcendental happiness or devotional service, which is the source of transcendental happiness. So this, this really helps us to understand clearly not to waste time to try to increase our material happiness by making plans in that way. 
Uh, live your life according to what you need and live happily so you can go on and pursue the real goal of life, which is Taktua Dehom Porna Jan Mani Naiti Mameti Surjana. Krishna explains that, yeah, when you know the nature of my appearance in this world and the activities that I that I perform, when you know that, then Taktua Dehom Porna Jan Mani Naiti, you don't come back again to this material world. You know, you're, in other words, you have reached perfection. You're on your way back to the spiritual world. So uh, this verse has very, it's very significant verse to understand both of these principles that are being emphasized here, especially the last one. And that is, don't try for material happiness, it'll come. <laughs> don't worry about material distress, you can't stop it, it'll come. Of course, we should, not, we should live in such a way as to not bring about these things in, in a way that is inordinate. In other words, uh, if we live a normal life, these things will automatically come. Of course, people nowadays, they try to uh, stop material suffering with another type of material suffering. For instance, intoxication. So there are living entities who think that by intoxication, I can free myself from the suffering that I'm undergoing. It's a kind of forgetfulness of what I'm experiencing or kind of, kind of a numbness to the reality of my suffering. But what they do is they, they compound their suffering but another form of suffering. As the verse says in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Napanyapi Napasyati. People see that everyone is struggling and everyone is suffering, but they think, no, I'll just do it a different way and I'll get a different result. In other words, I'll be different. I can push back material suffering simply by my intelligence, but that is not possible. Material energy is under the control of the Supreme Lord. Maya Dakshena Prakriti Suyate Sachiracharam He Tunan in Akuntaya Jagavi Parvi Partante. That uh, this material world is completely under the control of the Supreme Lord. It works through his energies, which are Parashya Shakti Virahaya Sumite Swabhavi Kigyala Balakriya Chahi. The energies work according to his desire. Krishna doesn't have to do anything when it comes to the material energy. He simply has to desire. He's automatically moved in that direction and things happen according to his will. That is, that is the power of the Supreme Lord. He is not engaged in any kind of material activities, but he influences the material energy simply by his desire. That's all. And many times he stays aloof from the material energy, puts it in place just like a watchmaker makes a watch and then simply allows the watch to go on according to his development. He doesn't have to keep, you know, making the watch work. It works already. That's how material energy works. Krishna puts it in place through his agencies and it works according to his will. He also sometimes intervenes in order to direct or not direct some particular activity, but that is simply by his. And that's why Lord Vishnu is considered to be the maintainer of the material energy. Brahma is the creator, Shiva is destroyer, Vishnu is the maintainer. But he doesn't touch the material energy like Brahma and Shiva do when they come in contact with their service. <laughs> Krishna is always transcendental. Okay, so these are some simple but very important points that we can take with us and live a less anxiety-free life when we understand that why waste time for trying to get material happiness? Why waste time to try to push back material distress just go above these things into the spiritual 
activities, and these things will automatically change or what we say, uh, reduce. Okay. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you for the wonderful class. Um, I request devotees if they have any questions or comments, uh, they can go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare well. Buddha Baba Prabhu. Hare Krishna, please. It's the Mamala Base and Sisa Voice to your Prabhupada. The voice to you, Maharaj. Thank you for a wonderful class. Um, if I may, if I could ask about the role of correction, if we know that, because in relation to karma, so you spoke about the fact that we, we have an allotted amount of, of happiness and suffering. And, and I'm just asking is also, I'm trying to clarify how Prabhupada and the philosophy deals with this. So we know that sometimes even in devotional communities, maybe something is done, which is not healthy, <clears throat> maybe even from a material perspective, what to speak of outside of Vaishnava etiquette. Could you say anything on the principles of how Prabhupada dealt with correction within a spiritual community and, and how that relates to this idea that our, that what we experience is also somewhat predestined from the karmic point of view. Uh, how he dealt with correction? You mean how yes. he impl yes. in, 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 implemented the, the, a, a, a corrective type of program? Well, yeah, either yeah, or, or, or as a society. Uh, yeah, we have different types of uh, what is it called? Different types of um, departments that deal with deviations, spiritual deviations, which also really are material activities. Spiritual deviations are more or less acting in the material way. Um, Well, the corrective principle is to come back to the actual standard. Um, punishment is not necessarily the part because we understand that punishment comes automatically by the activity. If you act wrongly, automatically there's a type of punishment. It's different than what the materialists get when they act because one is engaged in devotional service, maybe not on the pure level, but they get a, what is called a a corrective slap, you might say, as opposed to the full force of the of the normal karmic activities that would be played out. In other words, um, probably I give the example, this is due to our previous karma, that a person had, may have been a murderer in their last life. So um, they come to Krishna consciousness. And uh, so now um, they're engaged in devotional service. So that karma is still there, but now because of being engaged in devotional service, there will be a slight reaction from that previous uh, sin of murder, and it'll be much less. In other words, Prabhupada used a very simple example. You cut your finger. <laughs> That's how he expressed it. So something happens because there is some... So when we first come to Krishna consciousness, we plug, pull out the plug in the fan, but we still have the fan is still turning. So there is called Parabdha Karma, which is manifested according to what we need to correct in our devotional life in order to overcome the wrong activities due to our previous activities, previous karma. So Prabhupada wasn't so much punishing people. He was giving them the standard that which they could come up to. Okay, so if you've done this wrong, then, you know, stop doing this and perform this. So there were, uh, of course, he also put in a few, now, of course, our society has become more complex than doing with the, these things. And we also have different uh, Agencies, for instance, with Vishnu John Maharaj, 
was speaking to Srila Prabhupada in one in, about New Vrindavan. He was saying that in New Vrindavan, there's a board of brahmanas. They're the senior people in the community. And they, uh, if some, someone acts wrongly, then they go to this board and the board hears about the activity, almost like a court case. And then there is some, what we say, correction given or some punishment given. For instance, I was part of that and I had to, uh, I had the service one time of making sure people came to the morning program. Now I would stand there with my clipboard and when people came in late, I would notice it. I would note it and then later report it. And then a person, if a person was continually deviating in that way, there would be some restriction or some loss of some privilege. For instance, they may have to, uh, they couldn't get Maha if they didn't come to the morning program or like that. So some little bit of retribution or what we say, correction in order to create, bring about some retribution. But it's not like, you know, what we've seen even uh, when devotees have done something seriously wrong, rather than bring it to the, uh, you know, the public authorities, the material authorities, we try to deal with it ourselves knowing that, you know, uh, this is this is a devotee and it should not be subjected to the harsh uh, uh, punishment given by the materialistic society. We try to deal with it within the context of correction and not so much in, in, the, in the level of punishment. I don't know if that completely answered your question. Yes, Marge, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, when you're dealing with devotees, it's different than, you, than the laws that govern the material society. We're not meant to be punishers. We're meant to be uh, people that understand, well, this person did something wrong. Now we have to uh, educate them. So it becomes education rather than punishment. And of course, if someone continues to act in the wrong way, then they lose their privileges in devotional service and they become less, uh, less likely to continue in devotional service because the Krishna factor is within that. So much, you've seen you, you got, I, I heard you up to you when you said the Krishna factor and then, it, and then it froze. Could you repeat after what you said after the Krishna factor, please? Yeah, the Krishna factor works in such a way that a person cannot stay in the association of devotees. Krishna pushes them out because they're not qualified to keep that association because of their wrong activities, wrong, which, is, which is really their wrong mentality. Wrong activities can be corrected, but wrong mentality needs to be very much uh, dealt with in such a way that it doesn't continue having wrong activities. I mean, I was very much on, involved with that in New Vrindavan, having to s make sure that devotees were tending to programs. And if they weren't, I would have to report to the authorities. And then there were some restrictions, not punishments, but some kind of loss of privileges and just a way to show that, you know, you're not up to the standard. And uh, now we've actually developed the idea that, you know, we education is the best form of, of, uh, of re what's the word, rehabilitation. By educating people to understand what is the correct thing and what to avoid, that, that is the best way. Just in, like in penal systems in a, in a material world, they don't give any education, they just punish people. And therefore, people never change. <laughs> Punishment doesn't change a person. Concern, compassion, education, care, guidance, these are all meant as forms of rehabilitation for someone who is not acting right.
Thank you, Mona. Did I leave anything out? No, actually, I think that you answered the question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Devotees, any more questions or comments? Um, Guru Maharaj, I think um, there are no more questions, Guru Maharaj, today. Give it another minute or so. Let's see. Okay. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Marge, if I can ask one more question. <laughs> That's okay, but I don't want to take all the time with other people. No, you're keeping it, you're keeping us alive here. <laughs> <laughs> so Marge, considering you know Prabhupada left the planet in 1977, where where what do you think would be his emphasis in terms of preaching? in the world right now? What would he be focusing on? I mean, I actually, have, I think the Varnashram is part of it, but I'd like to ask you to elaborate. And what would he be emphasizing? If Just what would you feel his emphasis would be to the devotees and also his preaching strategy at this time? I, I, I personally feel very strongly, and it's based on Prabhupada's statements, that he wanted to develop a society where we're not dependent on the material society for our existence. And that, of course, that is the Van Arsham system. And then, of course, it plays itself out by living in a more rural and very simple lifestyle and more closer to nature. And not so much, Prabhupada said, these cities won't last. We can't stay in the cities. We have to develop these farms. These farm communities are actually the future of our society. He said 50% of his work was unfinished. And then he meant that fourth, because Prabhupada had four, four missions or four points to his mission. One, holy books, holy names, you know, spread the holy name and distribute transcendental knowledge. Two was to open temples and establish deity worship. Uh, three was to bring people to the standard where they can, can be qualified to become initiated and develop qualities of Brahman. That means the, the educational system along with the process of Diksha. And the last one, which we call it the unfinished business, was uh, these farm committees were Van Ashram. Uh, Von Ashram and farm communities are different. The Von Ashram system is to uh, evaluate devotees according to their nature and direct them into, into a service in that way so they can fulfill their propensities to serve in a more natural and creative way. Um, and of course, the farm communities are more or less the external manifestation where we can actually perform the Vanashram system more naturally because the cities are so upside down. So uh, there's a lot on that. I, uh, I just recently did my second series of it, of talks on that. I did one last year in May, and I did one this year in May, both four sessions. And uh, it's also, also transcribed and it's going to be published in the form of a small book. And so we're working on that now. But the idea was to go through Prabhupada's statements, and particularly the verses that he mentions in the 10th chapter of the first canter, canto. Uh, 110.4, 110.5, 110.6, 110.7, 110.8, 110.9, 110.10, 110.11, 110.12, 110.13, 110.14, 110.15, 110.16, 110.17, 110.18, 110.19, 110.20, 110.21, 110.22, 110.23, 
these verses there. Also 1839, 1840. These verses kind of illustrate the natural lifestyle of the living entity, which is conducive to the development of Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. And it is distinct from, uh, uh, because the, the living entity by nature is self-sufficient. And what we require is easily provided by nature. Nature provides everything we need in terms of the material requirements. It's already there. We live an artificial lifestyle which saps our energy. And Prabhupada mentions that in the first canto of the Bhagavatam, how people find themselves becoming sick, not so much because of... Uh, of uh, well, it, it, it may not they people become sick because they don't live right, wrong lifestyles, mm -hmm. they follow no rules or regulations, they're outside. We, as an, as an or, organism, we are part of the material nature, but being part of the material nature means to use your intelligence to understand how to fit into that greater scheme of how the material energy works. This is talking about how to maintain the material body without any well, wasting of time or excess endeavor. And that's mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And so what that comes down to basically is uh, living simply. And depending on nature, because nature provides everything we need. But if you try to exploit nature, nature won't, you'll be exploited by nature. <laughs> in other words, you get the reactions. Devotees try to live in harmony with nature because nature is Krishna's energy. So when we live in harmony with Krishna's laws, we live in harmony with nature automatically. And then nature will provide everything. So we don't need to live this artificial lifestyle. So that was Prabhupada's vision for the future. He said the cities won't last. He said they're, they're, they're doomed to, to collapse. And he said many other strong statements, very strong statements regarding the future of the materialistic society. Because he could see based on his knowledge that Sense gratification simply leads to suffering, and suffering leads to destruction when it becomes, you know, too much. Sinful life becomes a way of life that destroys everything. Destroy, morality is automatically destroyed, and civility is also destroyed. So Prabhupada understood. If you want to practice, if you want to live, you have to live according to how Krishna lived. <laughs> of course, he gave divisions for the different uh, different ashrams. He said for the for the grihastas, they should live on the farms and develop them. For the sannyasis, they continue to and for the brahmacharis, they can stay in the cities and and maintain preaching centers and bring people to the farms to their preaching. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada had a vision for all of the ashrams along with the greater vision. Mm -hmm. So uh, one question on that is that, um, so you talked about how, for example, one ashram is engaging people according to their propensities, but we do hear often in our movement that people should do the needful. And so just wondering if you could comment on, on on how that works. Well, that was initially the motivation for expanding the movement because the needful was the needful. <laughs> Not only was it needful, it was it wasn't optional. Now we have developed a infrastructure where we can uh, say that we have enough resources now that we can put more emphasis on developing the individuals. There wasn't so much emphasis on developing individual character. There was mostly emphasis on doing services. And Prabhupada knew that. 
he knew it. He was taking a risk because he knew that he didn't have much time and he was trying to expand the movement as fast as he could. But then in 1974, he said, you know, if chanting Hare Krishna is, a, is, is enough, then why are people falling down? Therefore, we have to establish this Van Arsham. That He changed from his previous uh, direction of the society in 1974, and then he started really emphasizing this. 74, 75, 76, 77, there's a lot of talks about the Van Arsham and about engaging and educating devotees according, accordingly. A lot of emphasis came on education. There wasn't so much emphasis on education in the beginning. It was mostly in establishing the society, opening temples, uh, printing books, distributing books, spreading the holy name like that. That was the emphasis. And I can remember that also, we didn't have much time for reading and studying. And sometimes reading and studying were seen as a deviation in the mission, <laughs> somebody who had that, uh, you know, that acumen, uh, they had to hide away in order to fulfill it. <laughs> now, I can tell you some personal stories and related to that. <laughs> and Uvrindavan was the epitome of that particular mood. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, our, our community leader, his motto was, you know, uh, work hard. <laughs> that was the motto. <laughs> work hard. And we had, we saw that. We didn't even have a Japa period in New Rindana as part of the morning program. There was no Japa period. You got up. You went to Mangalarti, Tosi Puja, Guru Puja, class, breakfast. 7.30, we were out there working, building, taking care of cows, growing things, doing everything necessary. And that was also the emphasis throughout the movement, along with the city temples. The city temples were really fully engaged in book distribution. That was the thing. We really, and they really took to it and did phenomenal amounts of work. But we saw how many devotees actually was able to maintain themselves in the long run because of not having enough uh, time for developing the knowledge and the education that was needed in order to stay fixed in devotional service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And people weren't working according to their, you know, nature. They were doing the needful. So, so Maharaj, on that was, so Prabhupada knew, and, and I, I remember seeing a quote from Prabhupada about some of the people he gave sannyas to. He said, I know some of you will not be able to maintain it, but this is an emergency, et cetera, et cetera. So what was his vision of what happened? Because he, he had that transcendental vision we know from his statements that he knew that some of them would not be able to maintain it. So, but is it because they sacrificed so much that he was able to give them that transcendental blessing anyway, that they would- Yeah, he, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm praying to Krishna to protect you. <laughs> he said that. He knew he was taking a chant if there was a risk. He also knew that people weren't fit for the sannyas order, but he gave it to them because he needed preachers to travel. And the enthusiasm was in that direction, and people were going for that because it was it seemed quite glorious at the time. <laughs> there was this, there was a certain you know uh, uh, aura about it that made it look good, you know <laughs> wow he's a he's a sannyasi Ooh, uh, he's a he's a temple president, wow. <laughs> You know, there was some kind of, you know, prestige attached to that. And that prestige had some, that position had some perks attached to it. <laughs> and one of the perks was you get to associate with Prabhupada. 
<laughs> more readily. <laughs> One other question, because um, you, you mentioned on a few occasions in the past, I think it's from First Canto, that there's a statement where Prabhupada says the spiritual master should try to understand the nature of the disciple and engage them accordingly. It's you, in the first canto. I think it's first can, canto, eighth chapter, but somewhere in the eighth chapter. Okay, I don't have the exact you. quote. Okay, I'll find it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, but there are statements. There's other statements in that same same regard. Thank you so much, Marge. Thank you, Thank you for your discussion. I think okay. Shuda has his or her yes. hand up. Yes, Prabhuji. Yes, Sudha Mataji, you can go ahead. Thank you, Mataji. Uh, Hare Krishna, Dhanit Pranam, uh, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you, Maharaj. I have a question, Maharaj. Uh, thank you for the very nice class. Um, uh, Guru Maharaj, you have mentioned like knowledge is not something um, uh, that you obtain it, but it's something like it's natural. That's um, that you need to bring it out. So just like uh, this real knowledge, can we understand uh, without uh, the material education? Um. Yeah, we have the example of uh, Gorkishore Das Babaji Maharaj. He couldn't even write his name. <laughs> yeah, we have many uh, great souls who, you know, couldn't even read or write, but still they were on the on the highest platform of knowledge. You have Suradas. He was blind. <laughs> And he was writing the most beautiful poetry in glorification of Krishna. So, yeah, devotional service in all respects is not dependent on anything material. But if you have such knowledge, it can be helpful, but it's not what we say required, it can be helpful if it's used in the right direction, the right way. If it's used to propagate your own ideas or your own position within the society, then it's a, a source of, uh, you know, your decline in Krishna consciousness. And sometimes people who were educated were thinking that they had, because of that material education, they were more advanced. But devotion is uh, the natural proclivity of the living entity's existence. And one of the principles for a devotion to, to manifest is obedience to authority. As long as one has that principle of obedience to a higher authority, then that obedience alone allows them to follow the instructions and then they make advancement automatically. You can simply try to understand the instructions in an intellectual way and come to the same conclusion as a person who simply accepts it. <laughs> the conclusion will be the same. But there are people who need that and therefore Therefore, we do emphasize education, but not as a, as a, uh, 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 what's the word? Something that is a must. In other words, spiritual education is there within the heart, and it's also brought out in different ways. But the essence is obedience to a higher authority. If I have to intellectualize why I have to follow what I'm asked to follow, that's one way. But if I simply accept it and go on, that is just as good. But there are people who need that intellectual. That's why Prabhupada said, 
If you simply chant Hare Krishna, you can reach the stage of perfection. Mm -hmm. But there are people who need that knowledge, which was most of, I'm saying, when I say people, I'm referring to most of us, we need transcendental knowledge in order to stay fixed in devotional service. But there are devotees who are so simple that they simply have faith in the Lord, faith in the spiritual master. And although they don't have much knowledge, just like we have the example of the, in the South Indian Brahmin, um, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he was traveling through South India. There was one Brahmin living in the Sri Rangam temple. And this Brahmana was illiterate, but his spiritual master gave him the instructions to every day read Bhagavad Gita, but he couldn't read. But that was his guru's order. So he would, he was trying to follow his guru's order. And he was holding the book. Sometimes he'd hold the book upside down because he couldn't read. And the other Brahmins in the temple, that sometimes they would chide him and ridicule him, knowing that he was not really, really reading because he couldn't read what he was trying. And he wouldn't pay attention to them because he would say, this is the instructions of my spiritual masters. But then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came along and saw him and said, what are you doing, Brahman? And he could understand that this person was not trying to criticize him. So he explained that I'm, I, my spiritual master has given me this order to read Bhagavad Gita every day, but I cannot read. But still, that is his, that is his order. So but Mahaprabhu noticed that he was the, the, the man was becoming emotional. And then he said, well, I can see you are feeling some, some emotion. Yes, when I look at this picture of Krishna, who was driving the chariot for his devotee, Arjun, oh, I think, oh, how, how wonderful is Krishna? He becomes the servant of his devotee. Then I become overwhelmed with emotion. And then uh, Lord Chaitanya told him, well, you have understood Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> You have, you have actually understood the whole, that the essence of Bhagavad Gita. So it's like your inner nature, your experience, that's more important. Like, um... Well, they work together. Mm -hmm. But to bring out that inner nature, I mean, there's some devotees who are very simple. Like you, you're very simple. So you can follow with no problems, but there's others who can't, they have to intellectualize everything in order for them to surrender. Mm -hmm. The gopis, they didn't intellectualize a lot. All they knew was Krishna was wonderful and they loved Krishna, that's all. That's all they knew. And they were willing to do anything to, to please Krishna. That's bhakti. So when you start off with bhakti, you start to cultivate knowledge. And then when you get to the next stage, bhakti and knowledge work side by side. But when you get to the highest stage, there is just bhakti because knowledge has taken shelter of bhakti and bhakti becomes the only feature of one's life. Okay. So on the highest platform, spiritual knowledge is hidden within bhakti itself. It's not something that one cultivates separately. Very nice, Maharaj. Thank you so much. I just um, have one more question. Like, uh, 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 like a lot of times, like, you know, body is temple. Like, you know, it's, we should not like uh, um, um, think about the body a lot, but Mara, just my uh, question is like Brahma Saukhyam, like spiritual happiness, which you mentioned. So in order to experience that Brahma Saukhyam, we should have this body, right? Because um, uh, do we experience that spiritual happiness through the senses, like sense objects, like, or it's just uh, independent of this? Uh... Yeah, it's completely independent. And the body has nothing to do with the soul. But because we live in a material world, for the soul to exist in the material world, it has to have a body. 
But the soul's existence doesn't depend on the body. The body's existence depends on the soul. So uh, this material body is the covering over the, over the soul. That's all. The soul also has senses. The soul has a mind. The soul has intelligence. The soul has form. So we're experiencing life through the material senses and body and, and mind. It's a covering. It's like if you put a glove over your hand, you, know, you may not be able to feel the object you're holding as much as you could if the glove was not there. Mm -hmm. The body is simply a covering for the soul, that's all. Okay, so both are independent. So even when we leave the body, that uh, spiritual happiness will be there, like... Uh, it's here. Yeah, the body, body is what blocks spiritual happiness. <laughs> it has, our body has no, we have nothing to do with uh, spiritual happiness. The body is, you know, it says, there's one verse, I believe it's in... Uh, what is that verse? Uh, I think it's the fifth canto, fifth chapter, verse number two. Uh, Lavanya, could you put up that verse, 552? Five, five, yes, good match. I think this is the verse that I'm looking for. Mahat Seva Dwarm Ahormi Muktis Tamo Dwarm Yosita Sangvi Sang Mahatmas Te Samachitya Prashanta Vimalayam Suridam Sadavo Ye. One can attain the path of living from only by rendering service to highly advanced. Hmm. I think this is not the verse. Um, yeah. Uh, there's one verse that says, um, but because um, to have a material body is unnatural. <laughs> it's in this same chapter. I'm not sure which verse it is. It might be number four or number seven. I'm not sure. Not sure. One of these verses here. Uh, keep going. Nunam prabhata kudute vikarma. This is also a very important verse. He does not know that due to his past misdeeds, as he re received the body, which although temporary is the cause of mid. Here it is. Okay. Actually, the living entity should not have taken on a material body. So you see, here this is the verse. But he has been awarded the material body for sense gratification. Because the, the living entity wants sense gratification, they get a material body. Actually, the living entity should not have taken on a material body. So that's the point that's being made here. But because the living entity desires it, the facility is given through the material energy. Therefore, I think it would not be fitting an intelligent man to involve himself again in the activities of sense gratification by which he perpetually gets material bodies one after another. Hmm. As long as the living entity desires sense gratification, there will be a body provided 
accordingly. If you want to eat all kinds of abominable things, you get you might get a body of a pig. If you want to stand around naked, you might get a body of a tree. If you want to, you know, whatever your prominent material desires are, you'll get a body that it will help you facilitate that. That is the that is how material nature works. That's why you see different types of bodies because people have different types of desires. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. I'll go through those verses. Thank you so much for your um, explanation. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. I'm going to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, Guru Maharaj, I have a question uh, regarding the society and uh, and uh, people in that because uh, recently we went to a vacation and met our old friends and relatives. So uh, in that, uh, uh, in, in those days, I understand that nobody knows about anything about Krishna consciousness or any other spiritual path. Um, but uh, sometimes uh, um, to maintain these relationships with the relatives and other friends, so we try to meet them. But um, I see that like this uh, is an opportunity to preach like uh, what I am doing or what we are doing as a family. Um, I, I thought this is this will be an opportunity to preach. But that was good. People or our friends or relatives, they were inquiring like why you are wearing Kantimala, why you are wearing Tilak, uh, what you do actually in ISKCON, all that they are curious and they are asking questions. I felt that it is a good thing uh, uh, to preach and they have some uh, curiosity. But uh, I feel that uh, when I am associating with them, I'm little afraid that my consciousness is going down because, um, okay, even though I'm uh, waking up early morning and doing chanting, but I feel that uh, I should not mingle more with the non-devotees. But as per preaching, uh, we have to go uh, to different, different places or uh, different meet different people. So how to do that, Guru Maharaj? Like, uh, well, we should have a nice balance and make sure we get enough devotee association to keep our consciousness strong. So when we are we are in this other environment with the materialistic persons, we're not so much affected. You are, as you, if you're strong, you're not so much affected. The strength of your uh, Krishna consciousness will allow you to become free from the influence uh, but that's why even the preachers, we sometimes we take a break in order to regenerate by reading, studying, associating with devotees in the more natural environment of devotional activities. So we need to always recharge our batteries, you might say. Uh, we can't just go in one direction because after a while we'll start to feel a little spiritually drained to use the word spiritually exhausted so keep that balance and make sure you have strong sadhana that's the most important thing but we also require regular association with other devotees which who can inspire us in our activities of devotion that's required yeah that's good yeah. thank you so yeah. much and in that, um, in those days, uh, we actually gifted uh, Srimad Bhagavatam set uh, to uh, my Prabhu's cousin family, and uh, they were very happy to welcome Srimad Bhagavatam. And we had a nice kirtan program at uh, at their house uh, mm -hmm. with some local devotees. So that was a good uh, Krishna conscious activity we could do, and uh, uh, we could invite uh, they could invite uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. Yeah. Any activity done to the conditioned soul will have lasting benefit even if they don't immediately take it up they will gain something at the initial contact and then grad gradually that will work where they'll get another chance to make advancement 
-hmm. It's something that happens gradually with the non devotees, little by little, mm -hmm. until they reach a certain point where they get some understanding that, wow, this spiritual life actually has some, you know, lasting benefit to it. They can actually experience that, like we have experienced it in our own sojourn. So yeah, anything you can do to help them. But if you're doing it with the same person, you have to see where they are and what's the next step that they could take. So we always see, all right, well, they're getting that much. And after some time, we invite them to come to the temple. We use, we use like the festival days, which are very joyful and there's a lot of socializing as an opportunity to connect them in a more direct way with the, with Krishna consciousness. Going to a Ratha Yatra, going to a Janmastami festival, uh, they, then they get some experience. And the most important thing is Sadhu Sangha. When they start getting association with other people who are some of people they less know, less, then they... Uh, start to see, oh, there's so many different types of people here and they're all doing the same thing. So, yeah. And then once they start coming in association, then you can invite them to attend classes. That's the next step. And uh, you can also invite them to, to attain study classes where they can learn Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, like the devotion separately from the regular temple activities. So, you know, we move them from one step to another. Yeah. And try to answer their questions as they yeah. go along, you know. But the strength of your own bhakti is, is the deciding factor on how much you can give them. So stay strong in your own practice and you'll be able to give more. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much. Hare Krishna. <laughs> yeah. Devotees, any more questions or comments? Gurmaraj, I think there are no more questions, Gurmaraj. Um, okay, so we can conclude here. Um, tomorrow, hmm. let's see. I think we should have a standby in case I can't make it tomorrow. Yes, Gurmaraj. I've been giving a lot of programs since I've come to the UK one after another and tomorrow is two big programs throughout the whole day. So I'll try. It's gonna be very unlikely I make tomorrow's class. Sunday is the special Kirtan class. Yes, uh, Radha Binodini, she knows all about that. So we'll be doing, I'll speak 15 minutes about Kirtan and then we'll have 45 minutes of Kirtan. That'll be the class on on Sunday. Monday and Tuesday should be back to the regular schedule again. And tomorrow, I, I doubt if I'll make it. <laughs> yes, good morning. Yes. We should keep the program going because yes, yes. this is something that is, uh, the, the whole idea is to inspire other devotees to come forward and speak also. Yeah. Yes, Guru Maharaj, sure, definitely. Um, I'll wait for you, Guru Maharaj, tomorrow. Um, and uh, uh, if you are not joining, then uh, I can ask uh, anybody else to give the class tomorrow. Um, yeah, I think you should have someone ready because it's very unlikely I'll make it. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Today is a, a Vyasa Puja day, um, Vyasa Purnima in US, Guru Maharaj. Um, I just offer my humble obeisances to you again as my guru. Thank you. Vyasa Puja for who? 
Yeah, sorry, Guru Mahal, Vyasa Purnima. I'm sorry, Guru Purnima and Vyasa Purnima day today. Um, oh, you mean um, uh, it is called uh, Guru Purnima? Guru Purnima, yes. Uh -huh. Tomorrow it's our yeah, yes, day sir. here. That is the disappearance day of Sanatan Goswami. And Guru Purnima actually means we celebrate the appearance of Vyasadeva, yes, who sir. is the who is the uh, Adi Guru. Happy Guru Purnima Day, Guru Maharaj. <laughs> Thank you, Hare Krishna. <laughs> Thank you so much. 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 Th